Um, good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to ASPE. Um, my name is Fergus Hansen, the head of the International Cyber Policy Centre. Uh, welcome to our brand new building. It's not, I'm told it's not the official launch, but you've got in before even the official launch to our brand new uh, facility down here. Um, and so it's, it's great to be able to have you here on this uh, very third, uh, well, first launch in this room uh, and a really uh, fantastic paper. I've got one housekeeping item, which is the bathrooms are located on a level two uh, up in the regular ASPE offices. Um, but I just wanted to begin by saying um, the, the Cyber Centre, when I first came here about a, a year and a half ago now, we had a look at the, the gaps in the landscape and one of the first things we identified was the lack of um, Chinese language skills focusing in on, on big, the big technology issues in this space. And one of the things I'm, I'm really proud about the centre is having now four um, Chinese language speakers on staff or as associates. Uh, and Alex uh, Joski is one of those and he has uh, produced an absolutely brilliant report uh, today. Working in a think tank, one of, well, the number one priority is um, to inform public policy. And um, I think this, this report delivers, um, informing public policy, this report delivers that in spades. It gives uh, new empirical evidence to a, a, a very serious national security uh, problem. And it gives people the evidence that they need to be able to understand what's going on and to make decisions uh, to fix it. It's been incredibly heartening to see the coverage that this report has received and the in-depth coverage uh, thousands uh, of words written in the Wall Street Journal, the Financial Times, the Globe and Mail, uh, with journalists taking the, going the extra mile and doing follow-up interviews with academics around the world uh, to investigate this story. And my favourite anecdote so far is one, I think, from the Wall Street Journal where they approached this uh, academic who had been working with a, a, a PLA scientist uh, working on, uh, operating undercover and wasn't aware of that. Um, but then he said the, the scientist actually told him that he was actually a PLA scientist and he just decided to keep on working with him anyway uh, on these technologies that are being used to develop uh, military systems and uh, very serious uh, systems to suppress human rights in China. So uh, I think that should suggest the, the, the room we have still to go. To introduce um, Alex tonight, we have John Garneau, one of Australia's great China minds. Um, as advisor to Prime Minister Turnbull, um, John was instrumental in shining a light on foreign in influence uh, here in Australia and working to put in place the fortifications to defend us against us, our adversaries. He's played an important role in uh, raising this debate in the United States and he's been a presence in um, all of our lives for a long time as a Fairfax journalist uh, serving as stints as both a China correspondent and the Asia Pacific editor. Um, it's a real pleasure to have um, so many great China minds in the room and, and two great ones here to speak with us this evening. Uh, John, I'll hand over to you. Uh, thank you, Fergus. And I haven't been this excited by a publication since Mark Stokes published his piece on political warfare in 2013. Uh, so for me, you know, this is just my kind of pet hobby. It's very, very exciting to be able to introduce Alex to you, who you all uh, know of. Um, I've known Alex since he was, um, I was going to say young, maybe younger. <laughs> uh, I've followed his work as an investigative reporter, as a commentator, uh, and now, most importantly, as an analyst at, at the very forefront of China research. Um, actually not just at the forefront of China research. Alex is so far ahead of anybody else in the field of uh, looking at international United Front work, looking at international scientific research collaborations, that he's actually invented his own genre. Um, so, so that actually poses very, very hard and actually quite serious questions about what the hell have the rest of us been doing all this time in the field of Sinology, and that is a serious question. It's not like this subject was hidden to us. I mean, this is a, the issue of 
civil military fusion and united front work um, and the pursuit of um, scientific technology. These are three issues which are led personally by President Xi Jinping and he says so <laughs> in his important speeches in Chinese. He's got commissions kind of um, leading this stuff which he personally leads. Uh, how is it that the whole China scholarship community forgot to look at this issue until now? Um, so thank you, Alex, for embarrassing us all um, greatly, but I hope provoking some hard questions and stimulating um, a, lot of, a lot of work. Um, so in my view, as we, as we uh, as a China watching community, you know, I think we'd be not so wrong so often if we bothered to read what Chinese leaders actually say and what they actually do, rather than what their intermediaries say they say and do. Uh, it sounds kind of simple, but it seems to be very hard in the um, Sinology world, and we have to ask, why is that? Um, and really the main point I want to make in, in my remarks, and the, the format will be, Alex will get up and, and do, uh, I hope, a little presentation, and then we'll have half an hour of, of Q&A and try and finish it at 6.30. But the main point I wanted to make is, um, this is an excuse for the rest of us, one of the reasons that Alex has done this work now is it's a response to the new era we find ourselves in. And this is a new era that wasn't, you know, it's not a product of President Trump's tweets. It's not a product of our own based domestic politics. Um, it's a product of a seismic change in world affairs that has come from Beijing uh, and in Xi Jinping's own language, the new era we now find ourselves uh, in. So it is inevitable that this sort of, um, as Beijing extends itself more and more forcefully into the world, that's going to be prompting um, a lot more scholarly work like this and reactions of all kinds, including regulatory responses. Uh, and this, the regulatory responses, indeed democratic responses, are being felt not just in Australia, but looking around the region quite recently, from the Maldives to Malaysia um, to, to Canada quietly, New Zealand even more quietly, uh, and above all, the United States. The messages, the signals, the forces that have been pushing out of Beijing are triggering international responses very early days, um, but we should be in no doubt about how the world has changed. And it's not just the fact that, that, uh, that China is led by a strong, a strong man leader who's more assertive in the world. It's a leader who's personally committed and explicitly committed to the ideologies of Lenin, of, uh, of, uh, of Marx, of Lenin and Mao a leader who is deeply and personally committed in his own words to military modernisation, to civil military fusion uh, and to united front work. So the question for all of us across a whole range of realm, a uh, whole range of issues and domains is uh, how do we face this new era we now fa find ourselves in? And I think the challenge we face as a nation and uh, in our academic institutions as well as internationally engaged corporations is how do we actively manage risk? You know, I think that's the new word we need to, the new paradigm we all need to be thinking in uh, all the time. So it's, this is something that shouldn't be foreign to us. We all manage, manage risk in our lives all the time. Corporations manage risk every day. Um, every serious university manages risk. Uh, the universities that are well managed and the ones that are working to understand their counterparties and ensure transparency uh, and have prudent management and effective oversight they're managing risk, they do this every day. Uh, I think there may be others who will wait for governments and enforcement agencies to do their risk management work for them, and I don't think that will be a pretty process. Personally, I hope that all of our universities uh, choose to proactively manage the kinds of risks that have been detailed in Alex's paper. Um, the issue is one that will sort uh, universities who are serious about risk management from those who are not. Um, broadly, you know, nationally, uh, whether it's institution by institution or, or nation by nation, this is not a question of ending engagement at all in any form, but ensuring that the engagement remains healthy and sustainable. It's about opening our eyes and working with the strengths of our open democratic system and shoring up some vulnerabilities. One of the barriers to coherent policy making in relation to China is that uh, they've done a pretty good job in propagating a series of myths and cor uh, corralling otherwise sentient people into false binary choices. The false dichotomies seek to polarise us uh, into caricatures of real world positions. Uh, you're pro or anti-China. 
you're pro or anti-Chinese, uh, you, you represent appeasement or you represent containment, you, uh, you think the world exists in either a field of economics or a field of security as if they, they're never interlinked, uh, you're either pro-US or pro-China. All of these false dichotomies ignore the real world of reality, the real world of opportunity and risk, which sit in between all of those poles and extremes. These false binary choices are designed to obliterate the rational middle ground where sensible decisions are made. So the detail of Alex's work will speak for itself and, and it should be scrutinised. Uh, and when, you know, there's plenty of room for criticism provided people are engaging with actually the evidence that he lays out, um, provided that actually people read the work. So, um, and, and we'll get a chance to ask a lot of questions in, in the Q&A uh, fairly shortly. But let me just mention that Alex was at Stanford uh, not long ago, and I kept getting notes from various doyens in the uh, sinology field, and one of them was from Orville Schell, who um, runs the China Centre, well, the, uh, I think it's called the China Centre, uh, at the Asia Society, and uh, written a bunch of really important books. And so Alex was presenting to a group at Stanford, including uh, Orville Schell, and he sent me a message, which I've kept on my phone, and he said, it's like watching a seven-year-old Yo-Yo Ma. <laughs> um, and I say this not to pump up Alex's tyres, but because you all know, need to know, and the broader world needs to know, that Alex is a very serious player. He will be leading in the field of sinology for a very long time to come. The empirical basis of his work is vigorous, empirical, rigorous, calibrated and sound. This work is not yet two days old and yet has already catalyzed important investigative work as Fergus has, has, um, has already pointed out and will catalyze a whole lot more. Anyone who chooses to attack the messenger, an Australian Chinese re researcher who has had the courage to go where the evidence leads, anyone who caricatures this work rather than engaging with the evidence will be picking a fight that they will not win. So let me congratulate Alex and his team and also Peter Jennings and the Australian Strategic Policy Institute for sponsoring this seminally important work. Thank you very much. Alex, would you like to say a few words? Thank you, John, and thank you, Fergus, and thank you to all of you for coming here. It's, it's great to see so many familiar faces, friends, and, and family here to support me. Uh, it was about three months ago that I joined ASPE, so this is my first ever time presenting a paper for ASPE, and I hope you enjoy it. Um, people like John and, and Clive Hamilton were, were really inspirations to me and have really brought me along in this journey. It was when I was working for Clive Hamilton last year that I really started looking at this question of Australia's research collaboration with China. And uh, like with Clive, uh, it was seeing the 2008 Olympic torch relay that I think really started off my interest in Beijing's activities in Australia. And it really has developed now into this debate, a national debate about our engagement with China and our relationship with China. About a year after the Olympic torch relay in 2008, a student called Wang Xiangke came to the Australian National University as a visiting scholar. Uh, I was a child at the Olympic torch relay and remember the burning flags and the scuffles between Chinese students and free Tibet protesters, but Wang Xiangke wasn't an ordinary international student from China. Chinese international students should be welcome to our country. They can make real contributions to Australia. Instead, Wang Xiangke had been sent here by the People's Liberation Army's National University of Defense Technology its premier university for science and technology. And he was sent here as part of its program to modernize and leverage the world's expertise for military ends, for the Chinese military's ends. While here in Canberra, Wang trained and worked in artificial intelligence and robotics. Papers he wrote at the time show that he was working on formation stabilization for groups of drones, for instance. His public work, however, is only a symptom of this, better, of this greater goal of developing better military technology for the People's Liberation Army. More important than his publications are the training and skills he received at the ANU, things that can't be published. He came to learn from us, not to give us the People's, People's Liberation Army's secrets. It's exactly this kind of upskilling that the Chinese military hopes to gain from sending its best and brightest overseas. Their focus on creating 
better talent for the PLA, shows that China's not just trying to reach the level of the, of the West with some help from stolen technology, but to go beyond the West in areas of military technology, to exceed the capabilities of our militaries in areas like missiles, aircraft, radar, and unmanned vehicles. And developing better unmanned vehicles for the Chinese military is precisely what Wang Xiangke aspires to do now, having benefited from the ANU's world-class experts, resources, and facilities. Wang is now an associate professor at the PLA, National University of Defense Technology, where the military has explicitly designated him as a scholar of exceptional potential. He's a chief technician on a classified military project whose name and subject have not been released to the public. His PhD thesis, in part a product of his work at ANU, has not been released publicly, probably indicating that its contents are classified. He's described as having long done research and teaching in the field of unmanned systems for autonomous combat. Simple internet searches indicate that the project he leads works to perfect drone swarms. What does that look like? A Chinese media article on his work paints the following picture. Dozens of rows of fixed wing air aerial drones take off from a runway. At speed, they form ranks and fly towards a designated battlefield area for a reconnaissance mission. Besides battlefield reconnaissance, Swarms of drones can overwhelm existing air defenses and destroy aircraft carriers. Flying one of these ex inexpensive devices into the intake of an F-22, for example, could take down the plane. How did Australia benefit from training this military scientist? All we have to show for it are a handful of research papers that he co-authored with his supervisor at the ANU. The Chinese military, for its part, produced a researcher who is developing technologies that might one day allow it to easily take out aircraft carriers and fighter jets with some help from the ANU. Wang's story is just one, one among those of an estimated 2,500 scientists and engineers selected by the Chinese military to study and work abroad in the past decade, around 300 of which have come to Australia. This global phenomenon is detailed in the report I'm here to present today the title of which comes from a saying used by the Chinese military to describe stories like Wang's, picking flowers in foreign lands to make honey in China. Using Chinese language sources and analysis of papers published by Chinese military scientists, this report presents the first detailed analysis of the nature and scale of this overlooked issue. It finds that the US, UK, Canada, Australia, and Germany are in that order the top countries for research collaboration with the PLA around the world. Globally, the number of peer-reviewed articles published as part of this collaboration has grown sevenfold in the past decade. It's an area in which Australia punches above its weight. Australian collaboration with the PLA has produced over 600 peer-reviewed articles and has likely involved around 300 military scientists coming here. Australia engages with, in the most research collaboration with the PLA among Five Eyes countries on a per capita basis at six times the level in the US. Researchers at the University of New South Wales publish more peer-reviewed articles with the PLA than any other university in the West. Two Australian professors even serve as doctoral supervisors at the PLA University. Who benefits? As Wang Xiangke's uh, case illustrates, the Chinese military benefits far more from these activities than we do because it recognizes that its scientific talent and universities are behind ours. Continuing this collaboration, where the benefits primarily flow away from us, is clearly not in, our, uh, clearly not in Australia's interests. With the windfalls of this massive expansion in the Chinese military's overseas research collaboration, China's ability to undermine our efforts in places like the Pacific and the South China Sea is enhanced. Some of this collaboration uh, falls into areas like radar, hypersonic missiles, supercomputer technology, and navigation systems. With hypersonic missiles, China could send nuclear warheads across, across the globe at six times the speed of sound. With supercomputers, an area where UNSW has collaborated with the PLA, the Chinese military tests nuclear weapons and designs advanced aircraft. With navigation systems on missiles, the PLA could better target and strike targets in Taiwan, a successful democracy, whose existence it detests, or ships in the South China Sea, where Australia conducts exercises and patrols. 
My report also uncovers two dozen new cases of Chinese military scientists concealing their military affiliation to travel abroad, including 17 who came to Australia, going to Curtin University and UNSW as visiting scholars to work on fields like navigation technology. PLA rocket scientists have also used cover to work on hypersonic missiles in Norway, uh, the EU, and the UK. Hu Changhua, for example, is head of the PLA Rocket Force Engineering University's Missile Testing Center, claiming to be from the Xi'an Research Institute of High Tech, as he does here, uh, which doesn't actually exist, exist. He visited a university in Germany for four months and didn't publish any research while he was there. It's difficult to say what he did in Germany, but the fact that his work for the PLA focuses on missiles should give us some indication. Here you can see him in a China Central Television documentary saying, I'm a professor at the Rocket Force Engineering University. Universities collaborating with the PLA have shown an incredible naivety in their engagement with China. Responding to my report's discovery of a PLA scientist spending a year at Curtin University working on satellite navigation while claiming to be from a non-existent Chinese institution, the Zhengzhou Institute of Surveying and Mapping, Curtin University today claimed that he does not deal with military information or technology yet it's self-evident that he came here to work of things of value to the Chinese military. Universities in Australia have failed to build up an understanding of China as their engagement with it has grown. We need to make a clear distinction between the beneficial collaboration with China we engage in and, uh, and collaboration with the Chinese military that ultimately harms Australia's interests. If universities continue to treat China just as a pot of gold, they risk tarring all of their collaboration with China with the same brush. We need to draw the line at technologies and end users that do not contribute to Australia's interests, at ones that in fact harm our interests. Helping the Chinese military bring its scientific talent and knowledge up to world-class standards is not in Australia's interests and demands a response from government and universities. The issues raised by this collaboration have not yet been addressed by governments and universities around the world. They should work together to advance scientific progress and foster cooperation while ensuring that research collaboration stays in Australia's national interest. The Australian government should develop a clear policy on collaboration with the Chinese military that informs legislative and other responses. The Defence Trade Controls Act, for example, should be amended to restrict transfers of sensitive technology to members of non-allied militaries, such as the PLA, when they're in Australia. Uh, a, an Australian professor might, for instance, uh, be barred from sending information on sensitive technologies to a member of the Chinese military physically in China, but that Chinese military scientist could legally come to Australia and learn those technologies. More effective immigration vetting should also be applied to members of the Chinese military who intend to use their knowledge and skills gained in Australia to develop military technology back home. Universities should take a more proactive approach to their engagement with China, ensuring that it doesn't compromise their own security and Australia's interests. Finally, we need an approach to the Australia-China relationship that's grounded in our values and interests. We need one that doesn't paralyze itself with the fear of causing the Chinese government offense, and one that doesn't shy away from calling a spade a spade and rectifying names. A healthy Australia-China relationship is one in which the kinds of activities I've looked at in this report can be stopped and, and, uh, and that collaboration can be carried out in a way that's in our national interests. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Alex. And uh, also rare yeah, amongst sinologists is there's somebody who can communicate. Uh, and my favourite line in the book is, uh, in your report, is the headline, Institutes That Don't Exist. It's brilliant. Um, look, I've just got one question to start off, and then I'll, but I'll, I want to go straight to the floor because I can see lots of people who can, will have lots of good questions. My question for you, Alex, is how did we get here? Can you explain to, how did we get to this extraordinary situation where we do seem to be making the weapons, helping to contributing to the weapons system, uh, some of which will maybe aimed at us one day? Is there one kind of instance that you can kind of identify or a couple of steps, missteps along the way? What happened? I think it really just comes from the way that, in a, in, a, in a broad sense, we've really been uncritical in a lot of our engagement with China. 
and universities in particular have simply treated China as a pot of gold. They haven't made this distinction between uh, beneficial and harmful forms of collaboration with China, and they haven't even distinguished between the Chinese military in, in many cases and China as a whole. Uh, so I think, I think the, the real issue is that we're not in a stage where we know enough about China, uh, where we feel confident enough about our relationship with China. It's not healthy enough uh, that we feel comfortable raising these questions and even discussing these issues. I was struck by your graph. It shows that um, there was some co collaboration in the old days, but then it just kicks up at about 2008. How, how do you explain that? I think it's, it's part of a deliberate push by the Chinese military uh, in, in response to this recognition that they need to not just reach the level of the West by stealing technology, but exceed it and develop quantum radar, for example, which they're doing at the moment. Um, and, and so the way to do that is simply to send scientists abroad and, and get the skills of cutting edge technologies in universities. Good. Thank you. I'm going to throw it straight open to the floor. I think we've got a, ro a roving mic for, for Clive Hamilton up the back here. Am I on? Yes, I am. Thanks. Brilliant, brilliant speech, Alex. Uh, congratulations, and congratulations for, for a superb uh, report, which is making waves around the world as it should. Um, but one thing that puzzled me in, in uh, the results of your work is the relatively low level of uh, penetration. As to why... Uh, so many more proportionally have come to Australia and, uh, and a couple of other countries? I think it's, it's probably the consequence of a couple of things. America has slightly better export control laws in this area where they actually do restrict some transfers of technology between an American in America and uh, a foreign national in America. Uh, they also, I think, have better visa screening procedures and they're much more clear-eyed about the challenges presented by China. Our universities are much more reliant uh, on money from China than American universities, and that's just led them to, to refuse to take a hard look at this collaboration with the Chinese military. I'd add one other point. They've got a pretty formidable FBI when it's, um, when it's on its game, as we've seen with a bunch of indictments just in the last few weeks. Questions? Please. I was really fascinated to hear about the methods that you use to capture this data. I mean, on the one hand, I guess there's the question about how you identify these institutes that don't exist. And on the other hand, there's the question about uh, finding all of these people and their citations. Did you use like Google Scholar <coughs> and scrape the data from there? Or exactly how did you, you capture all this? I think a key starting point is actually reading Chinese and reading what the Chinese military is saying in Chinese. because. If people had been reading the PLA Daily, for example, closely, uh, they would have seen this whole program spelled out uh, exactly. Uh, it's, it's not a secret. And, and we, we could have known about this a lot earlier if we'd just been reading what the PLA says a lot more closely. In terms of the, the, the data with peer-reviewed literature, I used a database called Scopus, uh, which just allows me to search through uh, all publications from a set of Chinese military institutions that I've identified as Chinese military, which includes some of these ones that are, that are actually covers. And that just it essentially came, came through by chance where I spent hours until my you know, brain got fried just looking at paper after paper by members of the Chinese military and Australians who were working with the Chinese military. And, and some of these institutions just had funny sounding names. I tried looking them up in Chinese and, and nothing came up and then I looked up the authors and it turned out every single one was from a Chinese military university that trains signals intelligence officers. Can I ask, what, just waiting for the next question, Alex, how long did it take to do this work? It looks monumental. I think I, I really started this work, as I said earlier, about a year ago working with Clive Hamilton. Uh, but the last three months have really been overdrive, you know, with the support of ASPE and, and, and working with, with my colleagues. Um, but it's something that can actually be achieved in you know, quite a short space of time if you're, following, uh, if you're following what the Chinese military is saying in its media and if you're using these tools of uh, academic databases. Please. Thank you for a 
Supreme Court. Um, what, what do you think? Why, why that until you have actually provided this information. What explains the lack of follow-up from or concern from any other Australian institution? Again, I think it's uh, just the, 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 the naivety and the lack of understanding we have in our approach with China. I think a lot of people are, are scared to even call out China for fear of any kind of retribution. When I think if we can't if we can't end this collaboration that I've talked about in my paper, then we simply don't have a healthy relationship with China. I think it's just that, that irrational fear of a response from China that you know, even if China were to, to, to do something in response to us ending this kind of collaboration, I think we should just take that as something that we need to do because it's in our interests. Uh, could I just add, um, there's, uh, I think there's probably some universities that are taking these questions seriously a very different thing to actually talk about it. So we may be seeing a bit of a bifurcation of, of the sector here. There's a question over there. Cool, please. Uh, thank you for your paper. It's great to see some young people being critical of China. Um, do you believe <laughs> the foreign interference laws that have recently been uh, passed will do anything in stopping this and making sure that uh, PLA personnel actually declare their, their full identities and affiliations when studying um, or operating. Thank you. So something that I haven't talked about in this speech is the work the PLA makes, uh, engages in to make sure that these people all stay loyal to the Chinese Communist Party when they're overseas, uh, and to make sure they all go back to China on time. And part of that is setting up Communist Party cells when they're overseas. And I estimate they've, they've probably set up well over a dozen of these Communist Party branches overseas because every single scientist they send overseas is a Communist Party member. The People's Liberation Army is the army of the Communist Party. Uh, it's possible that some of the activities of those party cells might fall under the legislation, but I think that to really deal with this, you know, we need uh, better export controls that, that regulate those transfers of technology within Australia uh, and, and better visa screening and clear policy from government that actually tells people some of this collaboration isn't in our interests. It's sort of, oh, sorry, please. It's sort of on topic. So as someone who was sort of the lone voice for Tibet since 1984 and, and brought Keating, Evans and the Dalai Lama together and formed parliamentary groups and so on, I've watched the Chinese embassy for years circling around and doing things that infiltration and things like that, intimidation and watching every move that we make. And I notice that Sweden in the last few months have charged a Tibetan with working as a collaborator with the Chinese embassy and infiltrating the Tibetan community over there. I've tried my hardest and I put it to ASPE to try to look to find out, because it won't be an isolated incident, it'll be a policy for every embassy to, I would imagine, to infiltrate Tibetan communities around the world. So I'm throwing it out of how we are going to uncover this here because there's a sort of naivety and it's regarded as a bit of a joke, but it isn't. No, it's, it's not a joke. I, I might just j jump in here. I think that is somewhere where the new interference laws can really help. Uh, How do you find them? And Who's going to do it? Uh, well, once people know that there's somebody that's listening, that there's actually part of the system in Canberra that cares, yeah. uh, that's a massive shift, uh, almost a revolutionary shift. So I'd be very surprised if, um, if, if there aren't, if this new legislation and the new institutions and the new attitude doesn't stimulate a lot more kind of uh, correspondence and communication with people saying, hey, we've got an issue over here. Um, but that will be a test, I think, of the effectiveness of the laws and the implementation. If communities in Australia can't feel safe in Australia just expressing their ordinary political rights, uh, then we've failed. Uh, sorry. Hello, thank you very much for that talk, Alex. Have you thought a bit about um, what's likely to be the PLA reaction to your research? I, yeah, I, I really think they'll be quite surprised that we haven't recognised this and haven't pushed back against this so far. <laughs> I mean, it's been going on for 10 years. This collaboration has grown eightfold, uh, yet, yet it simply hasn't drawn enough attention to date. Um, it's, it's something that they'll recognise as quite clearly you know, in our national interest to to control and better regulate and manage. Uh, and I, I think there'll be, I, I, I wouldn't expect a, a real pushback from China if we handle a response to this properly. 
But I would say that if there's um, willing advocates in the university sector, to, um, that they're happy to kind of you know, encourage the conversation if there's a, if there's a pushback from universities. Alex, um, has there been any uh, effort by a more reciprocal collaboration? So if you send 17 of yours into our top unis, we'll send two or three of ours into yours. And if, you pr if the government's proposed that, what would be the response from China? I think, I think we already send a, a small number of students to China's top technology universities, but they're just not the level of, not at the same level as, as some Australian universities, uh, British universities and American universities. And they certainly wouldn't let our scientists go back to the institutions they're coming from, these Chinese military institutions. And I think that's just demonstrated by the fact that some of them have even, even tried to hide, the, hide where they're from. Uh, so I don't think it's, it's, it's really possible to have true reciprocity in this. So you, it's not really then a collaboration, it's a very one-sided trade-off? Yeah, it's de okay. definitely not, uh, not, not a real you know, mutually beneficial process. Um, so China invests probably as much in its internal security services as it does in uh, PLA. Um, so is there a, do you suspect there's something similar going on in terms of China sending people to Australia to uh, understand technologies that they can then bring home and use to develop their internal security and surveillance apparatus? Yeah, I think some of this does have implications for kind of surveillance technology, human rights, for example. So some of the tools that uh, people have worked on while they're here are related to scanning the internet for intelligence, and that could easily be used to, to monitor internet traffic in China. Uh, some of the people who I've seen collaborating with overseas researchers are working on things like uh, automatic language detection on phone lines. So that, that's quite clearly got a security function. Let me just jump in with a quick question. Do you see any, um, uh, how do you compare the reaction of some universities to the Ramsey Centre um, uh, investments uh, compared to the reaction to your work on PLA involvement in their universities? Yeah, well, this is a bit of a dangerous debate to get into. <laughs> uh, but I think, you know, if, if universities were willing to have the same kind of debate they've had about the Ramsey Center, as they, as we should be having with China, then we'd be so much further in the way we engage with China. Uh, I think Brendan up the back there. Yeah. Alex, you did an extraordinary job getting getting to this material, but as you pointed out, a lot of it was what we would call open source. It was in Chinese newspapers. Have they done this? You know, is is it arrogance? Is it ignorance on their part? Overconfidence, or are they just not concerned as long as they can get to it? Yeah, one one of the the puzzling things about some of these people going overseas using cover and hiding where they're from is that they could probably just as easily go overseas and get visas while being totally open about their background. <laughs> um, and I think they've probably just fallen into a kind of complacency. When this program was first started around 2007 or 2008, there wasn't any, any reporting or statements coming on, uh, out from the Chinese military about it. It wasn't until around 2012, 13 that they really started talking about this. So it took them five years of us not paying any attention to it for them to, to feel ready to, to start talking about this. But I think generally the, the ease with which uh, you can show that some of these people are using cover indicates that China essentially thinks of their language as a layer of cryptography. <laughs> there is a question down the front here. I was wondering if part of the problem is that we have an, a lack of Chinese speaking people who are interested in defense and international matters because I have that impression that here we're not the best at learning foreign languages so perhaps particularly something like Chinese so perhaps you can enlighten me. Yeah, I mean there are plenty of Chinese speakers I can see here in this room and I think Australia doesn't actually have a massive lack of Chinese speakers it's just a lack of people working on China and, and looking at it the right way and working in the right areas. Uh, 
uh, I think you know, I studied at the Australian National University, and I think most of the other people there studying Chinese just weren't interested in these kinds of things. And I think it's a real missed opportunity for our country. There is a question right up the back here. In My question is, as application of your research, do you think that uh, the Chinese-related uh, uh, organization will be more careful about uh, their future approach? Uh, how shall you comment on that? Yeah, well, I, I certainly don't think they'll keep using these covers after this report's uh, out. Um, and, and they will try to use more clandestine methods, but it's important to just introduce these forms of deterrence and these barriers so that it's not as easy as you know, sending 2,500 scientists overseas in a decade. Thanks, Alex. Uh, Patrick Williams, government official, but here in an unofficial capacity. Interested in the panel's views on uh, the argument that while um, Chinese military uh, research R&D is at least partially mixed into Western university, universities and partially mixed into, um, or partially being published at least in uh, public domain, pub open access, that they can't, they're never gonna get a, a military edge in, uh, uh, at, at least fully. But the bigger risk isn't it that the Chinese military R&D decouples from uh, Western research and, uh, and goes on its own, goes off on its own, um, potentially overtaking, and that's, and that's the bigger risk, uh, at least from a military uh, technology edge point of view. Yeah, I think, I think you know, the, the ideal end goal for the Chinese military in this is, isn't just to reach the same level that we, we've got and, and come up with new technologies and, and work in areas uh, that, that we're not even thinking about or we're not up to the same level as, as them in. And uh, a key part of that is sending these people overseas so they can get not just ideas but generally training and skills and, and the ability to conduct research in a world-class way that will enable them to make those breakthroughs. Uh, Alex, in your report, um, you laid a lot of the, the blame, I suppose, on universities not investigating which scholars were going to be joining them and, and so on. Uh, but John, uh, earlier uh, in one of, your, one of your comments, you, you said uh, one of the US's advantages was their fairly formidable FBI. <coughs> is that saying that there is uh, more responsibility than just the universities? and? Who does that add at? And surely this can't just be the fault of the universities. Who else has dropped the ball here to, to allow, for example, so many scholars to enter the country from visas where they openly state they're from institutions that don't exist? Uh, uh, that's a fair question because up until five minutes ago, nobody thought this is a problem. No one's asking a question. People, you know, they were, universities were being rewarded for all the foreign research collaborations they could enter into. So in a way, personally, I feel like um, we should kind of give people a bit of an amnesty for, for past kind of blindness, but from a certain point, blindness becomes willful blindness when policy settings begin to change uh, and we get a better analytical understanding of what's going on. So universities are not at all solely responsible for this. This has been a national problem. We've never actually really thought hard about what our objectives are uh, and what risks are. But I think we're now in this new environment where actually everything changes. And so governments have a very uh, difficult job ahead of them of defining the problem and giving some guidance to universities to use as their handrails as they work it out. Uh, but in the end, uh, and there's, you know, there's lots of issues at the visas, at, at, the, at, the, at the border, but ultimately, I don't think universities can abrogate their responsibility to manage risk and to understand what's going on in their own, in their own institutions. There's a question over here. Oh, just following on from that question, um, is there a role for government to rethink its funding of Australian universities so they're not in this position of desperation and turning a blind eye? 
Yeah, I think one important part of responding to this is that you know, we need to control problematic collaboration, problematic ways of going about research, but also uh, encourage and, and sponsor uh, beneficial forms of research. And part of that is actually making sure we're properly funding research in strategic and emerging technology areas, and also making sure that scientists who are working on those sensitive technologies aren't also working with the PLA in, in a way that's dangerous. So part of that question might have been about the broader funding model for, for universities. Isn't it the government's fault that they've broken the funding model? I, I think definitely, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There's a, lots of work to be done in that area too. So there's a question down the front here. Um, oh, sorry. So, big voice, uh, we've probably only got time for about three more questions. Great work, Alex, for three months, a lot packed in there. I was just wondering from a, a report perspective, I think one of the questions that's inevitably going to be asked uh, of the investigation is, you know, what's, the, what's, the, what's the causal link or what's the evidence of uh, you know, a, a, a PLA background researcher in their previous research coming here and what they're actually <coughs> Yeah, some of the most interesting encounters I had in, in doing this research was actually sort of cold calling some of the academics who, who'd, who'd work with the PLA, and, and I got a whole range of responses. So Fergus Hansen, my boss, was really pushing me to do that, but I was quite reluctant, because <laughs> I, knew, I knew what kinds of responses I get from some people. So some of them were clearly hadn't, hadn't really re reflected on this and were quite, uh, quite shocked, but also angry. Uh, not, not at this person for sort of misleading them, but angry at me for suggesting that there's, they've in, sort of inadvertently benefited the Chinese military's technology. But some of the academics I spoke to uh, seem quite to, to, to have actually reflected on this. And um, you know, they, they, they thought that they hadn't been uh, appropriately careful. And in, in one case, this academic said that the technology that he'd, he'd worked on someone from the PLA on uh, is actually technology that's controlled by def our Defense Trade Controls Act. So if he were to give that same training remotely to someone in China, it would be illegal, but it's legal only because this person was physically in, in Australia when the training happened. Okay, can I just offer a, a small comment? I really do think these conversations are becoming much easier because there was a moment where people had no context at all. Like, hang on, where did this come from? Since when have we been we worried about Chinese hypersonic missiles, you know. So as this story gets debated in Australia, um, probably as vigorously as anywhere else, um, it is becoming more and more easy. Uh, we can have a more and more sensible conversation with, where it used to be very difficult no-go zone. So I think this is changing quite, quite rapidly from a pretty low base. Well, congratulations, uh, Alex, on an excellent report. Um, obviously, uh, China was a focus of your report, but China's not our only strategic competitor in the world. So would you believe, based on your research or, or your own understanding, that perhaps there are other countries that are also, I guess, exploiting now our universities and collaborating for their own ends? Certainly not to the kind of, with the level of brazenness and to the extent I'm seeing with the Chinese military. I think, you know, I'm sure, I think people from sort of Indian and Pakistani WMD programs have probably studied in Australia. There have probably been Russian military scientists. I, I don't know the details, but uh, it's simply not on this level of 2,500 sent, uh, sent abroad, 300 to Australia, just in the space of a decade. So in that respect, it, I think it, it really represents quite a unique issue. And because it's such a large phenomenon, it's, it's something that you really need to to, to treat uh, looking at its own char characteristics and its own intentions. And there are systems and structures set up for universities to deal with people from sanctioned countries. Um, this is a different category that hasn't been dealt with. So we've got time, I think, just for, for one or possibly two, two questions if people have got a, uh, got a sharp one. Brilliant piece of work, Alex. Um, on the question of COVID, 
bogus home institutions. How did the court recently meet for our universities to check that such institutions actually exist in China? I would have thought that you know, even the most basic academic rigor would suffice to do that sort of thing. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think the main onus in, in, in picking out these people who've, who've come here using fake institutions is on, is on uh, our government and our immigration authorities, but universities and academic journals, which have published thousands of papers attributed to these fake institutions, uh, could have easily worked this out. And it's been, you know, it's been going on for 10, 20 years, these, these, some of these fake institutions. Uh, if you search the names in English, all you find are academic journals that, that come from them. Sometimes they'll actually, uh, in one case I found uh, the, uh, someone using a cover listed this, this fake institution and also the address of the institution. If you look up the address, it's actually the address of a PLA military institute. So <laughs> it, it, it could have been found if, if anyone had actually questioned this and, and, and done a bit of Googling and maybe asked someone who speaks Chinese to help them out. I think, I think all of those, yeah. Uh, it's like the, um, the Chinese billionaire who was investing in, in um, dodgy regimes in Africa who put his home address as the Ministry of State Security. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I've just got one final question for Alex. Do you actually ever get a little bit worried or, or you know, nervous about um, what could actually happen to you if you're out in front of this debate in a pretty, um, uh, pretty high impact Yeah, well, I think um, it hasn't, hasn't changed the way I operate, but I am aware of, of the kinds of things China's increasingly doing. You know, it's kidnapped people from overseas. Uh, and, and recently we saw the burglary of sort of, sort of the leading Sinologist, the house of the leading Sinologist in New Zealand. And I think it's quite likely that that actually came from a foreign intelligence service. Uh, so I think we're really seeing China getting a lot more aggressive in terms of the way it tries to silence dissent and opinions it doesn't, doesn't like. But I think if, if we as a society kind of deal with this issue more directly and, and with a much stronger voice, we, we, can, we can keep going ahead. And just for the sake of Alex's mother, who I promised not to mention this, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not aware of anyone being actually dragged off a plane and physically kidnapped <laughs> from Australia recently. I, I remember about two years ago when I went to China, um, my, my mom sort of called up John John and, and demanded that he call me and give me a, basically a security briefing about the risks of going to China. It was so embarrassing to me. Because you know, <laughs> in all my work, I'd, I'd, you know, I'd really just been reading John's articles and, and trying to sort of follow up on them, essentially. So, so no, my, don't blame like, me. That's entirely unfair. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for your uh, excellent questions. This is a debate which has just begun two days ago, which is going to go for many, many years. We just started it. Uh, Alex, it is such a privilege to be, uh, well, to be alongside you for this event, but also to be uh, associated even indirectly and remotely with this extraordinary bit of scholarship which sets an entirely new standard about how we think about China and how we rigorously do the evidence-based work. So Alex is going to be here to sign some autographs. I've got to run. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming. Uh, enjoy the conversation.